Good morning. Welcome to Grace. Well, about a month ago now, we left our expository journey at the end of the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8 to be uh, specific, and we did this to celebrate the holy days, the holidays. And at the end of Mark 8, he had said, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus wants us to choose to follow him, and we discussed that about a month back, to follow him rather than to lead a life of sin in self-satisfaction. And I had concluded last time with the thoughts that Jesus' statement is really contrary to our human nature. The flesh does not like to submit to anything or anyone. We want to be the boss of ourselves, and really we want to be the gods of ourselves. And so the flesh has one desire and one goal, and it's really complete satisfaction. I want to be satisfied in me. So if we are to please the Lord and to be used of him and to have this assurance of reward in heaven, we must be willing to deny ourselves. So I want to pick up on a couple of things we left off with. We had said a month ago to be a disciple of Jesus requires a denial of self. And we must separate, however, here, the uh, denial of self from what is known today as self-denial. Self-denial is refusing certain aspects of life that rejects certain experiences and pleasures. Uh, ascenticism is a fancy term for that, that you deny any kind of worldly comfort for something else. And that can be important, that it, certainly there's context for that. But what Christ is actually talking about here is the worship of, of yourself over him. And that is considered idolatry. And Jesus demands to be in absolute control of our lives. We also talked about gaining the world means losing our soul. Now, there's no two other options I had said a couple weeks, or actually a month back now, that are more important than this, really. The temporary gain that brings eternal loss versus temporary loss in this life that produces eternal gain forever. And so the soul, it's an everlasting creation and will never cease to exist. But that eternity, uh, certainly what can be called eternal destruction, eternal punishment in the lake of fire, as we saw in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. But the last thing that we concluded with is that the kingdom is coming soon. And the atmosphere at the end of Mark chapter 8 is that the kingdom will be arriving in certain stages. And this is important as we continue on. Every person stands before God and gives account of his or her life as the Holy Spirit convicts every in individual person of sins. And the arrival of this kingdom and power is with the power that's made known in Jesus. And more specifically here is we're going to read about Jesus' transfiguration, but even more so his death his resurrection, and his ascension to the right hand of the Father in the Pentecost uh, that we get into in Acts. Uh, and certainly the mission of the church extends it here on earth. Uh, the kingdom's arrival will be finalized at the end of this age when Christ returns. So now we find ourselves in Mark chapter 9. And when we come to our passage of Scripture this morning, it's all about the blessed hope that we have in the return of Jesus. And it's the account of the transfiguration, as I just mentioned ago, of Jesus. Uh, but this transfiguration that we see is a preview. It's like a foretaste of the second coming of Jesus, which is coming soon. So let's go ahead and continue where we left off. Mark chapter 9, starting actually in verse 2. We're going to read to verse 13. So let's go ahead and read that together. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified." Verse 7, And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen 
from the dead. Verse 10, so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? In verse 13, where we're going to stop this morning in our passage. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased as it was written of him. And really, you see from the start, this is an amazing passage. The two primary thrusts of this portion here of Scripture is Christ, Christology, and discipleship. And so first, this is an epiphany story in which God reveals this pre-existent glory of his Son as majestic Lord of all. And then the second thing is the disciples continue to struggle and to understand what's going on around them, and they begin to experience this deeper level of comprehension. And so most of the Jewish people had only rumors of who Jesus was up to this point in the book of Mark, and they didn't have too, true real uh, identification of who Jesus was. And we get that at the end of chapter 8, verse 28. But when the disciples slowly begin to glimpse the reality, confessing Jesus as the Messiah, verses 29 and 30 of chapter 8, uh, when Jesus clarifies that his messianic office involves him as a suffering servant, they actually blatantly object, the disciples, that he can suffer. And then uh, leading Jesus to really clarify the true meaning of discipleship as suffering and as, as sacrifice. And so now God, here in our passage, reveals this final part of this section, that Jesus actually is the glorious Lord, the Messiah, the, the, the promised one in whom God's Shekinah glory, that's the, the pillar of glory that we saw in the Old Testament, uh, the presence of God dwelling, in the Hebrew it's uh, Shekon, um, this idea of dwelling among his people, and it's revealed here in Scripture, in, in our passage. So we all face difficult seasons of life, and perhaps you just came out of one with the uh, holy days ending, at least uh, the season of holy days. Uh, but these times when we are at a loss and we're unsure of what to do next, and there are even struggles so intense that the very foundations of our faith can actually be challenged. And in those times of uncertainty and despair, Jesus really always provides a word of assurance and hope. And I want you to discover with me that uh, the assurance revealed in this passage and hold to the truth that it teaches as you face these struggles. And so I want to examine with you this morning then the details of this encounter as we consider God's glory revealed. The first thing I want to look at is how attractive this moment really is. Uh, first off, though, there were 12 disciples, obviously, following Jesus in this uh, inner circle of disciples. But here, there's only three men chosen to make this trip up the mountain. And these men are part of what's been described as the inner circle. I mean, you got the 12, the outer circle, and then the closer ones. And on several occasions, uh, Jesus allowed only these three disciples named here, Peter, James, and John, to be a part of some special activities. And we read earlier how only they were allowed in the room when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. And these three would be called uh, to go a little further with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so they were there, and they were there specifically to see Jesus transfigured. Well, great. What does transfigured mean? Well, first off, we could see from the English, the root, or the, I should say not the root, but the, uh, the prefix of it, uh, trans, it means in our English language, across or through. That's what it, trans, uh, transgression we hear in uh, the Old Testament, especially it's a violation of a known law. Uh, more um, common words in our English language, translucent. It's allowing uh, light through or go across um, and pass through something in a diffused way. And there's transact to conduct business, transact to, uh, to go through with a deal. Uh, transcontinental, expanding uh, one large landmass to another on earth. There's transcultural, uh, meaning it goes through cultures, extending through all of human societies. And there's transfix, transformation, transitory. We can see that there, it's a very common prefix. Well, great. 
what does transfigured mean? Well, before we get there, I do want to stop here because our culture really perverses this prefix quite a bit. Obviously, some more popular terms these days in our modern culture, transsexual, transvestite, transgender. Uh, transgender is a very uh, hot topic in our culture today. But this is perversed. Um, and, but you get the idea of what English speakers think of this trans. So transfigured. Well, okay, figured. It's uh, uh, this idea, it, it actually comes right from the Greek. Uh, the Greek word actually for transfigured is metamorpho, or meta metamorphosis is where we get our English word from, metamorpho. But actually, verse 3 tells us what he means. <laughs> uh, Mark explains it out, what they saw, these th the three disciples. His clothing, clothing, Jesus' clothing became radiant, extremely white, like uh, no cloth refiner on earth can make so white. Uh, the ESV said to bleach, but uh, in the Lexham English Bible here, um, nobody on earth can make it this white and this radiant. And so what he's saying here is he's transfigured, he's transformed. And uh, Jesus had brought these men to this mountain to reveal this kind of glory, this very uh, 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 majestic glory. And Yahweh, the Father, had plans for them in the coming months and years, so he allows them to see this kind of glory. And they would be instrumental in the birth of the early church and the preaching of the gospel and the spread of the gospel. And so their faith would soon be tested like never before, and they would need this reminder of this power and glory of God to persevere through what was coming next in their lives. And while personally I've never seen his radiant glory manifested physically in this way as described in the Transfiguration, one day I will see him as he is. And he does manifest his glory today in other ways in my life, in our testimonies. And so there's uh, times then when he allows us to glimpse into deeper spiritual matters to encourage us and to strengthen our faith and to prepare us for what's coming next. And so the Lord knows exactly what we need and exactly how to equip us for the task ahead. Well, moving on, Elijah and Moses appeared to them together. Uh, you know, Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. This is not an illusion. This is not a um, delusion. Uh, these men really did stand with Jesus and them on the mountain, literally talking to Jesus. And actually, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke reveals that Elijah and Moses talked uh, to Jesus about his death coming. And so they're discussing the cross <laughs> looming in Jesus' future here, his near future, and his impending death to redeem humanity from sin. That's what they were specifically talking. But why these two specific men? Why is it Elijah and Moses and not, I don't know, uh, Melchizedek or, um, you know, somebody else? I don't know. I can't say dogmatically why these two are specific, uh, but I will say this. Some commentaries, uh, some commentators out there, they believe since Moses really represents God's law, and Elijah was the first of the mighty prophets of the Old Testament, uh, these men then to the disciples would represent really the span of the entirety of the known scripture, the Old Testament. That's, there's no New uh, Testament yet. It's being formed. So this is uh, their entire scripture the Old Testament, and that was being represented before them. You know, I don't know what you want to do with that. Perhaps that is correct, and that's why these two men were chosen. It seems to make some sense. Uh, but then it would be pointing to this uh, uh, culminating in Christ for history. But either way, you take why these two men were chosen, Elijah and Moses specifically, it is this attractive moment. It got attention. And so the Bible is Jesus' story. It's the message of salvation through his glorious sacrifice and the hope of eternal life in his resurrection. So history is indeed his story. And there's hope for us, all who are saved by grace, whether we live to see his second return or not. And so we move on to this instructive moment here. These verses reveal the, the confirmation of Jesus by the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. So Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, 
they actually weren't the only ones talking that day, as we see in verse 5. Peter answers and says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here, and let us make three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And this is another example where uh, Peter really speaks before he really thinks through things. He, he, uh, he's one of those ready, fire, aim kind of people uh, with his words. And he's done this times before, and he'll do it again. But here he wants to build three, uh, you, in some translations, tabernacles, tents, uh, as, out of respect, really, for um, these people. And we don't know exactly why or even what Peter was trying to do by building these tents, what he was trying to accomplish. And it's apparent from Scripture, neither did Mark, <laughs> verse 6. He didn't know what he should do or how he should answer because they were terrified. They were scared. So really, Peter wants to say something. And we soon learn that this Petrine idea, this idea from Peter, is not pleasing to the Lord. And it's easy for us to sit here and beat up Peter for talking so quickly and just coming up with something uh, that is near offensive <laughs> uh, to the Lord. But Peter felt as if he had to say something. He just didn't know what to say. And these men being scared and being in the glorious presence of the Lord manifested by the transfiguration, along with the appearance of Moses and Elijah, men who had been long gone from the earth for hundreds of years at this point. Who wouldn't be afraid? If you and I were there physically at that time, we would have been scared too. But there is a lesson here. And I think really the lesson is pretty obvious. When you are unsure what to say in a circumstance, it's better probably to say nothing at all. And actually, it's been quoted in our past, it is better to remain silent and thought foolish than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. And actually, this quote that's been quoted several times in our past actually has biblical backing. If you look at Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 17, even a fool who keeps silent shall be considered wise. He who closes his lips is intelligent. So really, Peter would have done better not to say anything at all. And I think this speaks to us. We don't always have to have something to say. We don't always have to impress. And I think people intend, uh, tend to um, uh, embarrass themselves in this kind of situation when they speak about things they don't really know about or don't have enough information yet. And sometimes it's better to silently contemplate the truth of God rather than always trying to offer others an explanation, maybe to impress them or something. And following this unsolicited response from Peter... This other unusual event happens then in verse 7. This cloud comes, and it says, A cloud came overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Yahweh, God the Father, affirms Jesus, God the Son, as his Son. And he admonishes Peter and the others to hear him in a very authoritative way. This was not about Moses and Elijah. This was about Jesus being recognized as the Christ. And he would soon give his life on the cross for our sin. And so he is the one we need to see and hear. He is the focus of this. And uh, verse 9 here, suddenly, or excuse me, verse 8, suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus alone. Jesus, again, he's alone. He stood alone with his disciples at the top of this mountain, just like they started. And likely, I think this is dramatically emphasizing the fact that Jesus alone is enough. And while it was exciting to see Moses and Elijah, they were not there for the disciples' benefits. And if these men had Jesus, these disciples, they had everything they needed. So Jesus alone is bearing their sin and providing their redemption. And he alone is worthy of our worship and devotion. And I think these truths really need to be emphasized today. If we have Jesus, we have everything we need. 
He alone secures our salvation and did. He secured it on the cross. And we are resting in his finished work, not in our own merits, not in our own works, not on the abilities of even other people around us. And I think many get caught up today in particular movements following specific men or women or institutions. And certainly that's happened to me. And in fact, when I first went to Northland, Northland Baptist Bible College, Northland International University, to get my degree in the Bible, I had this naive thought, this uh, dumb thought, that Northland would stop me from sinning. I had thought to myself, you know, I am a wretched sinner. I'm caught up in sin habits. Uh, I'm going to go to Northland. And because uh, there's such a high spiritual group of people teaching, uh, they're going to teach me not to sin, and I'd be, I'd stop sinning, and I'd be near perfect. Now, theologically, of course, I knew uh, 1 John 1, 8 and 9, uh, you know, if we, 1 John 1, 8, if we say we are without sin, we're, we're, lit, we're liars. So I knew that. So theologically, I knew it wasn't possible, but at the same token, I had this idea that, yeah, I would, I wouldn't be really much of a sinner anymore, and no one would be able to tell as long as I'm going to Northland. They're going to teach me. They're going to save me from my sins, is what I was kind of thinking. Maybe I wouldn't say it, but I was thinking that. So as each year passed, I found that I still sinned. And not only that, but actually I became more aware of the sins that I committed. So almost an opposite effect, instead of getting rid of my sins as I continued on Northland, I actually just became uh, I realized that, no, I'm, I'm much more of a sinner than I even thought. Now, certainly, uh, as my time there, I did grow spiritually, um, and I, I'd like to think that I did repent from sins and start, you know, uh, living a more Christ-like life as I grew there. But by the, uh, the last year I was there, I did lose hope for a very good reason that Northland was going to save me from my sins. And in losing hope in Northland, save me from my sins, that's what brought me to the realization it is God and God alone. It's Jesus who saves me from my sins. And the closer I walk with Jesus, the more Christ-like I become. It's not the closer I walk with the Northland people. It's the closer I walk with Jesus. In fact, I you know, have a great uh, theory that I would like to say is fact. If you want to trust someone... The best way you're going to trust them is know how close are they walking with God in a particular moment in their life. The further they're walking from God, uh, the less likely I think we are able to trust a person. But uh, the closer they're walking with God, the more we can trust them. And certainly, I'm thankful for those who were used of God to proclaim the gospel, to, to disciple, and certainly disciple me while I was at Northland. But we must be careful that we never elevate them to a position that's reserved for Christ alone. And I began my journey of salvation with Christ. And certainly it's only Christ who's going to carry me through it to completion. So going back to, or to our verses here, verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. I can't imagine, I don't think we could imagine, the excitement of these three men, these disciples, these inner circle men, at this moment in their lives. They had just experienced this unhindered glory of Jesus and witnessed him speaking, not only while he's glowing and he's radiant, but he's speaking with Moses and Elijah, two huge names from the Old Testament. And so they had to understand that they were greatly privileged to be allowed to witness such an event. But as they're coming off the mountain, Jesus says to them, listen, I've got one request for you. Don't tell anyone about this. Well, at least not yet. And I can imagine what they're thinking at the time. Lord, why wouldn't we tell anyone about this? This would prove you before the Pharisees, before the Sadducees, before others that doubted you that you are the Messiah. Why would Jesus want them to remain silent? And honestly, as I, I read these words, I don't like reading these words, these specific words from Jesus and other passages that talk like this. Why? Because uh, what's our natural response? We get excited about God. We want to tell others, this is what Jesus did for me. And especially like you, you see um, 
uh, new believers coming to the faith and they're so excited look what Christ changed me he brought me from death to life he brought me out of my sin and walking with him and that's exciting and we want to tell people about it and how much more exciting would have this event been and Jesus says don't talk about it or at least not yet well regardless uh, Jesus gave this command and they were expected to listen to abide by it and we're expected to follow the guidance and the leadership of the Lord even when it doesn't make sense to us and we don't always understand what the Lord is doing and maybe we won't in this life ever understand what the Lord's doing until we get to the next life eternity with him but we still remain faithful and I think sometimes we dislike particular passages of Scripture, but that doesn't give us a right to ignore them or refuse to abide by them. And in a sense, we become God when we choose, oh, I'll listen to this part of Scripture, but I'm not going to listen to that. It's, it's like us making the authoritative decision, this is the Word of God, but I'm going to take out this Word. No, we must be willing to submit our lives wholly to the whole counsel of the Lord. And that brings us then to the... Uh, this instructive moment, and no doubt this uh, experience, this was an experience that these men would never forget. It's an event that comes, you know, we say it comes once in a lifetime. Well, no, this is like once in history, in human history. However, as wonderful and as miraculous as it was, the disciples uh, were having trouble really processing this, and who wouldn't? Everything that they just experienced, and as they're making their way down the mountain, still talking with Jesus, it's as if their confusion and lack of understanding seems to increase here. And so Jesus uses this as this thought-provoking moment. And it's our last point this morning. Uh, our journey with the Lord, it's a journey of faith. We are blessed to have the written word completed in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the, the word to guide our lives uh, but we are trusting also in one we have never physically seen. And the Holy Spirit offers, offers this continual guidance as well. But we too find ourselves confused at times. And I'd be lying to tell you this morning that I understand everything that I read from Scripture because I don't. I come to parts and that I, I, I get confused and I lack understanding at times. But that really drives us then, and it drives me to rely on the Lord. It's not my knowledge that's going to get us through Scripture. It's God and His Word and the Holy Spirit. And we pray to the Lord. We pray for His wisdom in these moments of confusion and uncertainty. In verse 10, they kept the matter to themselves and discussing what this rising from the dead meant. And so clearly Jesus is speaking of His coming death and resurrection. But the disciples are still not getting it. And in their defense, yeah, the resurrection has not happened yet. But certainly this is not the first time, even in the Gospel of Mark, that uh, Jesus had spoken to them uh, to his impending death and resurrection. And actually, in fact, just a few days prior to this, he spoke of being rejected by the Jewish elite and then dying at the hands of, uh, hands of sinful men, and after three days, rising again. And when Jesus is speaking this, uh, Peter gets mad about it, and he rebukes Jesus. He tells Jesus, stop talking like that. The boldness of Peter to do such a thing. And so the disciples, they've heard Jesus talk about his death and his resurrection, but as of yet, they still are not understanding it. They're not really receiving it. And I don't think we would be willing to admit it much, but we too are guilty of at least a similar thing, if not the same thing. And what I mean by that is we often quote verses that bring comfort to us, and we should. Or verses that agree with our plans at a particular moment in life. But then we can ignore or even claim to a lack of understanding. We don't understand verses uh, that uh, regarding passages that bring a severe conviction to us, or maybe we don't agree with because it doesn't agree with what we've already chosen. And actually, personally, I think I have more trouble with the passages that I do understand at times uh, than the passages I don't understand. Why? Well, because I know God's word then, and I, it, it's usually clear, and I must abide by it, but maybe I don't want to. And so I struggle with that. And the disciples struggle too. In verse 11, they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? 
Well, that's kind of odd that that's the next question, but if you think about it, it's not too odd. They just saw Elijah. Elijah's on their minds, and they're asking why these scribes teach that Elijah, mu uh, Elijah must come prior to the Messiah coming and establishing his kingdom. And they're talking actually about a prophecy that is written in Malachi, Malachi chapter 4. Um, Malachi prophesies that uh, Elijah would return prior to the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh. So I want to read that to you. Verse 5 of chapter 4 says, Look, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahweh, or in most translations, the day of the Lord. And he will bring back the hearts of their fathers to the, uh, the sons and the hearts of the sons to their fathers so that I will not come back and strike the land with a ban. And this speaks this day of judgment. And it, it really, this day of judgment here is following uh, the tribulation. It's the end of the tribulation. And some believe that these two witnesses that are spoken of in Revelation that come at the latter half of the tribulation, they believe that it's Elijah. And even so, Elijah and Moses, uh, the two. Now, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if it is true that at least one of these witnesses is Elijah, then this portion of Scripture, this portion of prophecy, would be certainly fulfilled with that. And again, I'm not saying dogmatically it is, uh, but it's just some food for thought as we come to Malachi here. But back to Mark. <laughs> Uh, he says, Elijah, uh, Jesus says, Elijah indeed does come first, and he restores all things. And Elijah does come to uh, first turn uh, the people's hearts toward the Lord. And they're, the disciples are unaware at this moment, but Jesus, and we know this from uh, other the gospel accounts here, Jesus is actually speaking of John the Baptist coming in the spirit of Elijah, preparing the way for Jesus and his earthly ministry. But then he goes on in the second half of verse 12 here, how it is written, concerning, he's saying, and how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Jesus is bringing back their focus. He's like, yes, uh, Scripture talks about Elijah, but Scripture talks about me. And yes, this prophecy of Elijah is important, but it's also, uh, there's, there's prophecy of me uh, suffering and dying as the Son of Man. And so Jesus wants us and these men to understand that he would soon give his life on Calvary to atone for sin. And his coming as Savior and Redeemer of the world should have been their first focus. And that's what this is about. And theologically speaking, we know the death, the burial, and the resurrection is a theme of the Bible. But how often do we focus on the gospel or speak it to others? I think sometimes as uh, Christians here, we get uh, focused and more caught up on the aspects of Jesus' miracles and some of the details there uh, than we do with his, his great sacrifice for our sins. And yes, we do talk about Jesus' miracles, but we need to make sure we know what the focus is. Uh, it's like getting uh, lost in the forest, looking at the different leaves and tr uh, branches of the tree than looking at the whole forest. We tend to focus on the little things and get caught up in them. And so people get more excited, I think, about Jesus walking on water or healing various diseases than they do about uh, his drinking the cup of God's wrath in our place. And I don't want to minimize, and I'm not trying to minimize any portion of Scripture here, but we must never elevate any Bible character or a biblical event above the finished work of Christ redeeming mankind in his glory. So Jesus continues, I tell you, indeed, Elijah has come. And that's what he's talking about. It was John the Baptist. John the Baptist and Elijah share many similarities in their appearance, we learn, their demeanor, and their ministry. John the Baptist was actually, really, you can consider the last of the great Old Testament prophets. He's definitely not a reincarnation of Elijah. It's not that, but he's one who came in the spirit of Elijah to complete Elijah's work. And so John the Baptist comes preaching a message of repentance, declaring Jesus as this Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his preaching and boldness ended up costing his life. 
And having said all of this, the disciples understood that Jesus was speaking of John the Baptist. Uh, and we know this because of uh, Matthew. Matthew chapter uh, 17 says they understood. The disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. That's how I could be dogmatic about that point. But we get to the end of the sermon now. We say, so what? So this had been a familiar passage for most, but it does reveal great truth. Jesus wanted these men uh, to see him for who he was. And they would neither, uh, well, I should actually say they needed that reminder of his glory as they faced difficulties that were coming in their near future. Just like we need reminders of God's greatness as we come up with these difficulties in our futures. And they needed to learn, just as we need to learn, Christ alone was enough. And so if they had him, they can persevere. That's all they needed. And I think as we too get these reminders from time to time, as we walk with the Lord of his glory and his power, like Peter uh, we will get sidetracked at times, and we place emphasis uh, on others or other institutions or whatnot, other situations, when we really should be resting in the Lord. And he, only he fulfilled the work of redemption by himself. And he alone is our source of salvation, our source of strength, our hope. And there's no doubt that these men had witnessed such a wonderful majestic miracle. They just encountered the, the Lord in unveiled glory, speaking with the Old Testament saints. But their focus was more on the visitors at that moment than on Jesus as displayed by their questions they had after. And so they had trouble comprehending uh, Jesus' words regarding the resurrection. So they did walk with the Lord, but they also would lose focus and had difficulty understanding. And that rings true today with us. So what do we do? We remain, we have to, we must remain close. Have a close relationship with the Lord. Be in communion with Him. Walk with Him. Talk with Him. And spending more time in prayer, more time in the Bible. Why? Because then we get to know him more. And the Lord provides wisdom and understanding to those who genuinely seek it. It brings up James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, what do we do? We ask from God. We pray. He will give it. So are you struggling with your faith today or understanding what's going on and why it's going on? Well, then come to Jesus for wisdom and for salvation. So in conclusion, are you resting in Christ alone today? If not, I want you to come to him, to receive him today and to receive the provision only he can give, not me not you reading your Bible. As good as that is, and that you should be, reading a Bible doesn't save you. It's accepting Christ and accepting his work that saves you. It's his gracious offer of salvation that is free to you and cost him everything. So I urge you to come to him today. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your work. It is not based on me. It's not based on my performance. It's not based on Northland. It's based on you. Lord, I thank you for these great examples before me. Just as the disciples had Elijah and Moses to turn to. That we today have men and women of God we could turn to. But that is not our focus. Lord, I pray that we would remain anchored in you and you alone. That our security does not come from what happens 
or what doesn't happen. But our security is in you. Lord, you promise to come again. We see the signs of the times. We see your return happening soon. So, Lord, we pray to come soon. Lord, I also pray if there's anyone here this morning in our sanctuary or who's listening online who does not know you as their Savior, who's trusted in other things to change them, to save them, to bring them from death to life, that they would repent today before it's too late. And the first time ever that they trust you alone. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. If you're listening online, um, and this is a blessing to you, let us know about it. Let me know in the comments if you prayed that prayer with me. Um, if, you, if the Word of God touched you today through this sermon, let me know by either commenting in the chat section in YouTube or calling us at 906-771-5851. And uh, let me know that we might pray for you and with you. Also, consider uh, giving to the Ministries of Grace. There's uh, giving baskets in the back, or if you're joining us online, uh, there's a couple ways you can give. You can go to our website at gracekingsford.org slash give, or toward the bottom of the front page, the landing page, gracekingsford.org, you can give. Or you can even text us. Uh, the number will be on the screen here in a little bit, but um, it's 906 206 or excuse me, 208, well, whatever. The number's on the screen for you uh, if you'd rather give by text. Uh, thank you. I think we have one last song to sing, so let's go ahead and stand and sing in Christ alone. <laughs>